This morning, we're going to continue in our study of Hebrews. We've now begun in Hebrews chapter 2. That's where we'll be. And again, I want to take it slowly. I don't want to rush through it. And today, we're only going to be covering the first four verses of Hebrew chapter 2. And I've titled today's message, Anchor Yourself. Um, and the passage that we're going to be reading today, in those first four verses, um, the writer's going to explain why, it's, why it was necessary for him to point out the super superiority of Jesus over the angels, which was what we covered last week. And again, we're going to be talking about how not to drift away from the faith. I know maybe may, many of you have questions about that. Am I drifting away? How can I prevent myself from drifting away? What can I do? What do I, you know, I, what are the signs of me drifting away? This message here will show you how to anchor yourself. And when it comes to drifting away, that is, you got to be really careful of that because that can lead to full-on backsliding. And that's an area where you definitely want to avoid. You know, when you're drifting away, there's still a possibility, there's still a chance, you know, for you to come back. It's easier for you to come back to the Lord. But once you backslide, and it's, I'm not saying it's impossible, but it just gets harder and harder the further, the more you backslide, the further out you are. Um, and so hopefully this message will encourage all of you that are here, all of you that are listening if it has, please share it, send it out. Um, someone around the, someone maybe around the world may watch it and their lives will be forever changed. But before we get into God's word, let's pray and ask the Lord to speak to us this morning. Heavenly Father, uh, another great and wonderful chilly uh, Sunday morning here in January and we are thankful you have us all here. Lord, even though there may be a few of them, many of them are going through really challenging times, struggling with different things, Lord, um, they know the importance of, of being here, of sitting here, listening to your word, reading your word, uh, really discerning and, and, and finding out what it is that you're, you want to speak to them about, what it is you want to tell them, Lord. And, and that is a, an amazing sign there that the Holy Spirit is working hard within them, Lord. So I pray that you will use this message to change lives, to convict hearts, and again, speak to us powerfully. We love you and praise you in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1. And the word of God says, For this reason we must pay attention all the more to what we have heard so that we will not drift away for if the message spoken through the angels was legally binding and every transgression and disobedience received a just punishment just punishment how will we escape if we neglect such a great salvation this salvation had its beginning when it was spoken of by the lord and it was confirmed to us by those who heard him at the same time, God also testified by signs and wonders, various miracles and distributions of gifts from the Holy Spirit according to his will. So after having established the supreme authority of the Son of God in verse, verses 5 through 14 in chapter 1, the writer now builds on that truth by taking a, mo a moment to inform us of what we ought to do with the information that he's just given us. Again, he stops. He, he will continue later on in this chapter, but right now he stops and now directs his attention to the reader, to the Jew who was reading, the, Christian, the new Christian Jew who was reading this when it was uh, first written, and now to us as believers. See, given the super superiority of Christ over the angels and his identity as the divine son of God, Jesus both demands and deserves to be heard. In the Old Testament, messages from angels came with such authority and power that 
their recipients were often nearly frightened to death. So how much more should we lend our ears to God's word now that he has spoken to us by his son? We must, we must, ladies and gentlemen, pay attention. We must listen to the God who speaks. Because if not, it just would be foolish. It would be foolish not to listen to the God who's, who, who created this universe, the God who, has, who holds the cells of your body together, the God who holds all the atoms of this entire universe together. It would be foolish not to listen to what he has to say. The danger is that if we don't, we might drift away from the gospel message. The language of drifting conveys a, a, nautical imagery, a nautical imagery. In the ocean, those who row in the wrong direction are not the ones who fail to reach their desired destination. It's also those who do not row at all. The point being that in the Christian life, there are two options. We can either sail forward in fidelity or we can drift backwards in faithlessness. There's no such thing as standing still in the Christian life. Spiritual drift is often unnoticeable when it starts. But just like the boats in the sea, our souls can veer almost entirely off course in moments. And the fact is, that you don't need to be far off course to end up a very long way where you initially intended to go. Well, the writer indicates that there's only one way to fight against the danger of spiritual drift. We must pay attention and obey the word of God. Our faith in Christ and our obedience to him are the oars. Imagine two oars of a boat. One is our faith in Christ and one is our obedience to him. We must, those are the oars that we must use for fighting against the current of spiritual drift. Knowing what you believe and practicing it will keep you sailing forward. The fight of sanctification or becoming more like Christ, more like Jesus, is a fight against the tides of this world, of the world, the flesh, and the devil. See, either you're listening to the Son and walking in His Word, or you're drifting away from biblical thinking and getting carried away by the winds of modern culture liberal Christianity that really doesn't care or is indifferent about the, what the Bible really says. And sadly, we see this happening in many churches today, in many denominations, in many families, and in many individuals today. So how do we avoid the danger of Spiritual drift. The answer is in the beginning of verse 1. We must pay attention all the more to what we've heard. See, hearing the word of God is just as important as reading the word of God. That's why, you know, I'll spend time. The first thing I'll do is read the entire word of God. And then I'll explain it verse by verse. Paul reminds us in Romans chapter 10, verse 17. So faith comes from what is heard. And what is heard comes through the message about Christ. There's, there's more to that. It's not just hearing. It's not just sitting here and hearing the word being read. Uh, well, keep in mind that when scripture talks about hearing, it also means more than just audibly per perceiving or hearing God's word. For example, concerning those who didn't believe in him. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 13, verse 13, looking, they do not see, and hearing, they do not listen or understand. 
And so what I mean is hearing the Word of God rightly involves more than just having someone just read it out loud. You must also spiritually hear it, which involves believing what it says, obeying what it says, and submitting to what it says. We must listen and hear with the heart. Here's the thing, Christian. There isn't a secret formula to faithfulness. John 17, 17 basically tells us that God does all the work by changing us through His Word. However, in order to not spiritually drift off, it's important that you read, hear, meditate on, and obey Scripture. As B.B. Warfield said, when Scripture speaks, God speaks. And so it comes down to this. If you want to avoid spiritually drifting off, drop the anchor of your souls deep in the waters of the Word of God. Now verses 2 and 3 further explains this point. In case you're wondering what is the message spoken through angels, what that is, all you have to do is do a general brief read of some of the stories there in the Old Testament. A lot of the stories there, in a lot of the stories there, you'll see that the angels delivered, delivered messages on behalf of God and that each of these messages was legally binding and 100% reliable. The New Testament also records several angelic messages in the Gospels, such as the announcement of Christ's birth in Luke chapter 2, or the announcement to Cornelius in Acts chapter 10. However, as the following phrase makes clear, the message mentioned in Hebrews chapter 2 verse 2 is, is, um, is also, well, it's probably referring to the Mosaic Covenant that the Bible indicates was delivered through angels. The next phrase is, in a sense, a summary of the Old Covenant as delivered through angels. Every sin justly deserves punishment. And that's the logic of the Torah. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19 summarizes this principle. I call heaven and earth as witnesses against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Choose life so that you and your descendants may live. And so the message is simple, very easy. It's not hard. You obey, you live. You disobey, you die. See, under the old covenant, every single transgression of the law demanded a just penalty. And so the point of the author's argument is now a little more obvious when he writes, how will we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? He's moved from the lesser angels and the old covenant to the greater Jesus, the new covenant. If the old covenant that came from God was delivered by mere angels demanded retribution for sin, how much more will God judge those who have spurned the gospel now delivered to us by his son, his very own son? This judgment is explicitly portrayed in Revelation chapter 19 as Christ returns to trample the winepress of the fierce anger of God, the Almighty. Friends, the danger of spiritual drift isn't only that we might miss out on a spiritual flourishing life. The true danger of spiritual drift is that we abandon the gospel itself and find ourselves under the judgment of God. You've heard the gospel. You know the gospel. It's in your heart. You probably haven't memorized, and yet it doesn't change you. 
or you've come to know Christ and you're still completely disobedient. You abandon the gospel itself if you have and you risk being under the judgment of God. So you see, the gospel is good news, though, when it's accepted in the place of the bad news. And what's the bad news? We truly do deserve going to hell for transgressing against God's righteous requirements. The really bad news is that we will be even more accountable to God if we reject Christ. So thus, the seriousness of the gospel cannot be overstated. So if you're listening to this, let me put it simply. The gospel is good news for those who repent of their sins and trust in Christ. But it's terrible news for those who don't. Hebrews chapter 2, verses, uh, verses 3 and 4 of our passage here further shows how Christ's superiority over angel relates to the danger of spiritual drift. Again, the contrast is clear. clear. Failure to hear the reliable message brought by angels brings retribution and death. How much more guilty then are those who reject the great, uh, reject the great salvation declared by the incarnate Lord himself? This new stage of redemptive history brings great privileges, great blessings, but also great responsibilities. The author indicates that the message of the new covenant that was begun, was brought up by Christ, this great salvation is superior to the message delivered by angels in at least four ways. First, it was spoken of by the Lord. Once again, the author leans heavily on his previous declaration that God has now spoken to us by his son. These words are essential for understanding the logic of theology, of the theology here in Hebrews. Second, this message was confirmed to us by those who heard him. Though we, though we may not, not often think of it, the New Testament consistently teaches the profound theological importance of the testimony of the apostles to the person and work of Jesus Christ. After all, Christ set apart the, set apart the apostles and commissioned them to function as the foundation of the church. We don't believe in myths and legends about Jesus. The message of the gospel has come down to us from the credible eyewitness te testimonies testimony of the apostles. Third, God himself testified to the veracity of the gospel by signs and wonders and various miracles. Many Christians, while rightly affirming the histor historicity of, of God's miraculous works, their history, and that they did exist and they did happen, usually often misunderstand their purpose. Well, here the author of Hebrews reminds us that miracles don't exist for their own sake, meaning they, they don't ultimately point to themselves. Instead, miracles attest and validate God's major works in redemptive history. In the New Testament, miracles prove and confirm the truth about the identity and work of Jesus Christ. And finally, the gifts of the Holy Spirit attest to the truthfulness of the gospel and its superiority over the message delivered by angels. Once again, the author of Hebrews helps us, helps us to strip away our misconceptions about why spiritual gifts exist. See, spiritual gifts are not an end to themselves, to be used for our personal 
private enjoyment. No, not at all. According to 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and Ephesians chapter 4, they're to edify the church and to testify that Jesus Christ is Lord so that God will get the glory. As Paul explains in Hebrews chapter 4 verse 8, Christ has ascended on high and now with all authority in heaven showers gifts on his church. Gifts within the church, therefore, bear witness to Jesus Christ as the resurrected Lord and to the superiority of the new covenant over the old. So, again, church, our text here, these four, first four verses, has, makes it abundantly clear that every Christian faces a danger of drifting away from the Lord and from his word. This isn't just a danger for unbelievers who have heard the gospel. It's a danger for all who've heard and embraced the good news. One commentator wrote this, the transcend transcending concern of this warning text is for those who have heard. Even more, the concern is not for those who reject the gospel, but for those who ignore it. The concern is for one's attitude, the one who has let the greatness of Christ slip away, the one who, is, who no longer marvels at the atonement, the one who no longer has desire for the word, the one who really doesn't pray in the spirit, the one who is drifting back to where he came from, and has little concern about his drifting. So all of you here, and all of, the, all of you watching, if drifting away is, uh, is a grave danger for every believer, then it's important for you, it's important for us as a church, to recognize when we're drifting. And so what are some possible symptoms of drifting. Let me suggest a few. You are drifting when your sense of wonder begins to wane. Many years ago, my family and I, we took a trip to the Grand Canyon. It's a beautiful, great, majestic place. I still have memories of it. And although it was a cloudy, I think it was rainy days, snowy day, you couldn't see all of it, but we could see I mean, even what we could see, it was just beautiful and amazing. And just to be there with my family, it was great. But as majestic and as beautiful as I saw it to be, it can be very easy to forget its beauty and majesty. You know, you, and I'm sure maybe those who, locals who live around the area can forget how great and how, majest how majestic and how wonderful the Grand Canyon is. Even here in the area, you know, we have some beautiful spots, beautiful areas. You can go hiking and, you know, the mountains are, are, are beautiful. That We live, you know, right, we can see through our kitchen window, we can see the mountain. Just, it's, it's pretty neat when we see it covered in, all covered in, in clouds and when it's covered in snow and it's covered in greenery, it, you know, it's... It's pretty cool, again, just the, how great our, our mountains can be here. But it can be very easy to forget its beauty and its majesty. So likewise, when we read the first verses of Hebrews chapter 1, we're informed of the majesty and splendor of the Son of God, our Savior. If you've lost the wonder of your Savior, and His salvation, and maybe you're drifting away. Number two, you're, you may be uh, drifting when your awareness of the nearness of God has become ancient history. If the intimacy you once knew and enjoyed is now a faint memory, then you're probably drifting if you can't think and remember and 
about those times you and the Lord were really close and intimate and you can feel his presence. You could just, you know, you, you knew he was there and you just loved it. You felt secure and safe and, and now you're not feeling it. It's a, oh, it, that was old. That was back in, that was back last year. That was six months ago. It's not, you know, <laughs> if it's become a faint memory, then something's going on there. You may be drifting away. Number three, if your love and desire for God's word fall short of what you find in Psalm 119. Now, I won't read that entire psalm. It's a pretty long psalm, but in your own time, read it. And as you read it, ask yourself, is that my heart and my desire? Is that, do I feel the same way about God's word? And if it's not, then maybe you're drifting away. Number four, the realities of heaven and hell seem distant and unreal. Maybe at one time I did, but now I don't know. You know, it doesn't seem logical to me that God would, you know, punish people in hell and, you know, um, or that, yeah, even heaven seems... How can I believe in a heaven where everyone's going to be rejoicing forever? I don't get it. I don't understand. It doesn't make sense to me. Well, is that the same way you felt when you first came to the Lord? Were you you're just like, yes, I'm going to be going to heaven. And I'm, you know, I'm so looking forward to it because I don't ever have to suffer the things that I've had to suffer here on this earth. I don't ever have to deal with the sicknesses. I never have to deal with the pain and, and the sorrow and I will be with the Lord forever. Is that still your heart about heaven or and even hell? You know, you don't take it as seriously anymore. You don't take hell seriously and it just seems like, oh, it won't happen to me. It'll happen to others, but it's not going to happen to me. I'm better. I'm, you know, I go to church and I, you know, I do my best. I give money to the church. Hell doesn't apply to me. I can live the way I want. I'm saved anyways. Well, you're still going to be held accountable. You know, and God will, you know, he's the only one that will judge you whether, you know, you're going to be with him or not. But were you at one time fearful? Were you at one time fearful of what, that it strike, it just completely put fear in, in you, the, the thought of going to hell. Well, if it's not there anymore, then again, something's going on. You may be drifting away. Number five, you fall apart at the first sign of suffering and persecution. What do you do? What's the first thing you do now? When you are suffering, when you are going through a hard time, when you feel like you're being spiritually attacked, when you feel like you're, when you're being persecuted by the people around you, do you buckle or do you remain strong? Do you hold on to the Lord? Do you stay on the boat with him? Do you just say, no, I'm not going to allow these things to, to get to me. I'm not going to allow these things to affect my spiritual walk. I'm going to keep walking with the Lord. Is that your mindset? Are you still there? Or again, do you buckle and say, oh my goodness, I need to, I don't know what I'm going to do. If you fall apart, the first sign of suffering and persecution, you may be drifting. Number six, if you're unaware of the constant downward pull of the world, the flesh, and the devil. Are you paying attention to what the world, the flesh, and the devil are capable of doing to you? Or are you just ignoring it? Well, if you're ignoring it, 
and not paying attention to the, to the dangers, you may be drifting. Prayer, Bible study, witnessing, not just with your words, but also with your action, actions, and going to church have become a duty. You need to do it. It's, part of, it's an obligation. It's a, something that you have to do. Is, it, is that what it is, or is, rather than an enjoyment? Do you enjoy coming to church? Do you like coming here? Do you like fellowshipping? Or is, do you wake up every morning and be like, oh, you know, I've got to deal with those people. I've got to talk to Angel, and I've got to just put on this smiley face. Like, I'll tell you right now, you don't have to put on a smiley face with me. You don't have to be fake with me. You know, Robin and I, we've, we've met um, people that weren't genuine in the church. And we know, you know, we want you to be authentic. We want you to be you. If you're hurting, if you're suffering, if you're not going, if you're going through a hard time, we'd rather know about that and to pray for you and maybe encourage you than to see you and know that something is going on, but you're pretending like nothing is. We're not going to drag it out of you. You know, you need to tell us. We want you to be genuine. You need to be genuine here at the church. Again, I don't know what your experiences have been in other churches, but we want it to be different here. Everyone should want it. I mean, if someone sees you upset and, you know, if you see someone upset, what I'm trying to say is, you should go up to that person and say, How can I, what's going on? How can I pray for you? But again, you should enjoy coming here. You should enjoy, even regardless if, if someone's up here singing or whether it's YouTube, enjoy the worship. Enjoy worshiping the Lord. Again, it's, it's not... I, the way I see it, it's not a matter of, uh, you know, whether it's a YouTube video or how someone is singing or, or what instrument they're playing. They could be playing the, the cajon or they could be playing the triangle. But worship is worship. Worship, you're worshiping the Lord. You should enjoy that. That should be enjoyable for you. It shouldn't be a burden like, oh, my. oh man, like I, I don't like this song. I don't like this, the way it sounds. It's not about you, ladies and gentlemen. It's not about you. It's about Jesus. It's about the Lord. It's about worshiping him. It's not about how the song makes you feel. You can do that on your, in your car radio. You can switch the channel. But with worship, regardless of what song it is, when it's true authentic worship, when it's truly like giving glory to God, that should be the heart. That should be your heart, the song of your heart as well. So again, if, it's just not, if that's not what's going on, you're not enjoying coming to church, you're probably drifting. Um, Next, or number eight, you may be drifting if the Lord's table is dull and the preaching is boring. Do you look forward to communion? Do you look forward of that time that I usually give you before communion to come to the Lord and lay all your burdens, all your sins to Jesus? Do you look forward to that? Do you look forward of... of breaking bread together, the fellowship that we have, even the preaching, you know. I know I'm not the best preacher out there. I know there's probably better speakers, a lot better speakers, preachers out there, pastors out there that are probably more knowledgeable, that are more charismatic, that maybe have their notes memorized and they don't have to, they can be walking around and walking down there and, you know, and make you feel good and motivated you know i know that's that's out there but that's not me i need to be me you know but it's again is it boring to you is it not speaking to you well i believe regardless of who's up here regardless if they have years and years and of experience or whether they have just one year of experience when they're reading the word of God, when they're sharing with you what the Lord has put in their hearts, it ought to speak to you. Something there, something here in his word ought to speak to you. Something in the message that they're delivering to you ought to speak to you. Again, the Lord has called that person to preach the word. 
I know I believe that. And if I didn't, I wouldn't be here. I'm not trying to make a name for myself. I'm not you know, trying to be rich. I'm not trying to do any of that. I'm just being obedient to the calling which I've been given. And, and again, I know I'm not the best, but I'm just giving you what the Lord has given me. And I do my best. That's all I can do. If you want something greater, something, I mean, I'm sure there's other churches out there, you know, but I am who I am. And if it's boring to you, then maybe you're drifting away because there is a message for you. Even if at times I'm not making any sense and I mumble through my words and um, it's got to be some, something there. That's for you. That the Lord wants to tell you. All right. Um, a few more here. Um, you may be drifting. If remembering the work of Jesus Christ on the cross doesn't emotionally move you. At times you've seen me sharing a message, a message about Christ and what they did to him. And I, I feel it. I get emotionally moved when I think about what they did. I, I can't even watch Movies, crucifixion movies, any of the Jesus movies, even the shows that have been coming out. I can't watch YouTube videos because again, I start to get, I start to see the reality, how it, it may have really happened. And it just moves me. Well, if it doesn't move you either, then you may be drifting away. Uh, you become autonomous rather than deeply dependent upon other believers. Number 11, I, you lack joy and gratitude for all that God has done for you. Number 12, you ceased growing in faith, hope, and love. Number 11, you're looking for something. Number 13, sorry. You're looking for something more, more outside Scripture and outside of Christ. This is something that Paul deals with in Colossians chapter 1 and 2. In Colossians chapter 1, Paul declares the supremacy of Christ. In chapter 2, Paul writes that, that in Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Well, that in Christ are the hidden the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. He then goes on to warn us about Seeking wisdom that is not according to Christ. So now, let me begin by, with let me get, begin to end with some words of exhortation, some words of encouragement to both believers and non-believers. The author of Hebrews has urged us to take the word of God much more seriously. But just how do we go about this? How do you take the word of God much more seriously? Well, here again, let me just offer a few suggestions. Meditate, especially when it comes to the sermon, to this message. Meditate on the sermon, on the sermon passage during your quiet time. Invest in a good set of commentaries that can help you explain a little more. You know, our time here is limited, but there's much more information that could be said about this particular passage, these four, first four verses of Hebrews chapter 4. So invest in a good set of commentaries. It doesn't necessarily have to be books. You can find them. There's a lot of good apps. There's a lot of good information out there and on... on on good Christian websites. I know I use um, David Guzik's commentary a lot. I get a lot of wisdom from that. Um, a lot of uh, Spurgeon's commentaries on scriptures. Just to name a couple there, you can find those commentaries online, but also talk and pray with friends about the sermon after church. Talk to your wife, talk to your children, you know, about what they learned about. Maybe you can talk to each other about what you 
what you heard. There are times even when I, we're, we go home, Robin and I, and I ask her, how, you know, what would you think? And then we discuss about the sermon. But um, listen to, and here's, this is important, listen to and act on the sermon throughout the week. Develop the habit of addressing any questions about the text itself. If you have questions or comments about what we just read, these first four, verse, verse, first four verses, uh, write them down somewhere. Put them in the box if you don't want to talk, you know, mention it, talk about it right away, and, or text it to me, and we'll talk about it. It's, you know, ask those kind of questions. It's good to ask questions. There's nothing wrong with asking questions. Cultivate humility. Don't be so prideful here. Don't be so prideful with, oh, I think I know it all. I, I understand exactly what this all says and what it all means. That's pride, if you think you know it all. You know, there's probably a lot of stuff out there that you don't know. For you Christians, you believers, my prayer for you is that God will make you aware. That you will, he will show you when you begin to drift away from Christ. And I'll also be praying that you pay much more attention to that which God has revealed to us through his son, who again is vastly, vastly superior than the angels. And I'll also be praying that you remain anchored, to anchor yourself on Jesus, on the word of God, so that you will not drift away. And finally, I have a word for those who have never dropped anchor by confessing your sins and trusting in the work of Jesus Christ for your eternal salvation. Being in close proximity to the gospel or to other Christians, that's not going to save you. Hearing, just hearing this message isn't going to save you. Listen to these words of our Lord, of Jesus, from Luke chapter 13, verses 24 through 29. Make every effort to enter through the narrow door, because I tell you, many will try to enter and won't be able. Once the homeowner gets up and shuts the door, then you will stand outside and knock on the door saying, Lord, open up for us. He will answer you, I don't know you or where you're from. Then you will say, we ate and drank in your presence and you taught in our streets. But he will say, I tell you, I don't know you or where you're from. Get away from me, all you evildoers. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth in that place. When you see Abraham, Isaac, and Isaac Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourself are thrown out or you yourself are thrown out, they will come from east and west, from north and south, to share the banquet in the kingdom of God. For those watching and are there on the cusp, on the edge there, it's time to confess your sins to confess that you're a sinner and to trust in Jesus now. To trust in Jesus today. Not tomorrow. Today. Knowing about Jesus isn't enough. You must personally accept the gift of salvation that he alone offers. No other religion, no other prophet, no other guru will offer this salvation. Only Jesus, he alone is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by Christ, but by him. As the next verses of our passage that we're going to look at next week informs us, the Son of God humbled himself by taking on human flesh thereby identifying with lost sinners, thereby, thereby identifying with all of us, all of you. He did that so that by his death 
on the cross, he could bear the punishment of your sins and give you eternal life. Don't be among those who knew about Jesus, but who never entrusted their eternal future into his hands. And so if you're ready to do that, if you're ready to entrust your your future in his hands and you're ready to be born again, you're ready to drop anchor, to anchor yourself in Christ, invite you to the cross, become born again. If you're ready to do that, I want you to close your eyes and bow your head and with all your heart, all sincerity, though again, the Lord knows if you're being sincere or not, but pray this with all your heart. Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner and I ask for your forgiveness. I believe that you died on the cross for my sins and rose from the dead three days later. So now I repent of my sins. I turn away from them and confess you as my Lord and Savior forever. Thank you for dying for me and thank you for saving me. Now fill me, Lord, with the Holy Spirit so that he may help guide me in my new born-again life. In your name, amen. If you prayed that, reach out to us. want to help you in your next steps. If there's anything we can do, let us know. If you have any comments, questions about what we went through here, again, reach out to us either on Facebook, there, on YouTube. Um, If it's blessed you, just send us a simple message. Um, on either one of those platforms saying that uh, you were blessed. I want to hear from you, regardless of where you're from. If it's in a different language, we, it's okay. Um, we want to know. But um, there's angels celebrating right now. You're born again. You're a new believer. You're no longer headed towards death and destruction and hell. You'll be forever with the Lord in his heavenly kingdom. So let us know how that, you, you prayed that, and, and we, we just want to continue to pray for you and maybe help you find a church in your area where you can learn the Word of God. Thank you for being here with us. Thank you for joining us, taking time out of your day, out of your Sunday, whatever day you're watching this or hearing this. Um, if you're in the area here in El Paso, where our church is located in the corner of Hondo Pass and Gateway South here in northeast El Paso, right next to the mountain over here. Um, But uh, come join us. Have a sit for a bit, hear the word of God, and have a donut with us, some coffee, and have a great time. Again, thank you. We look forward to seeing you next time. We love you. God bless you. Goodbye. Thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope you were blessed by Pastor Angel's message. For more information about Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, such as our service time or how to get connected, please visit our website at fvccelp.com. If the Lord is leading you to give to the ministry of Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, there's a PayPal link in the video description below. Once again, thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope to see you again soon.